Great. Thank you, Olivia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alasi Victor, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar, Session 3, Caring for a Patient with Suspect to UTI. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. I'll provide you with details on access and the recording at the end of this webinar. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of this presentation. And um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Carrie Barton with the Massachusetts Department of Health. Carrie? Hi. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shira Darone and Dr. Kira Bola today. Shira Darone is a physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Tufts Medical Center. She has been the physician head of the antimicrobial stewardship program there since 2005 and is also the associate hospital epidemiologist. On a national level, Dr. Darone serves on the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America Antimicrobial Stewardship Subcommittee and the Infectious Disease Society of America Antibiotic Stewardship and ID Leadership Working Group. Here in Massachusetts, Dr. Darone has been involved in several statewide initiatives to improve the care of patients with suspected or confirmed infection. Dr. Darone has numerous publications related to antimicrobial resistance and stewardship. Prasanna Kira Bolek is a pharmacist who trained at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy, completing postdoctoral training in infectious diseases at Hartford Hospital. She is the pharmacist head of the antimicrobial stewardship program at Tufts Medical Center, as well as the infectious disease pharmacist for the institution. Dr. Bolak is involved in the Massachusetts Society of Health System Pharmacists, the Council of Boston Teaching Hospitals for Pharmacist Education, and the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists. Her research focus is in methods of optimizing antimicrobial use. Thank you both for speaking today. All right, and thank you. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started with a quick polling question to kind of get a sense of um, how everyone feels about the topic today. So we're going to be talking about caring for the patient with a long-term, uh, well, we're caring for the long-term care patient with suspected UTI, and really focusing on the differentiation between colonization and infection. So uh, Jennifer, would you mind opening the polling question? So um, I'd like you all to respond in uh, the bar on the right. Uh, with respect to antimicrobial stewardship, do you feel that your facility A has a program in place? B, has a feasible plan to implement the program, or C, has little or if any program. So, again, this question is in regards to how you feel about your facility's um, uh, position with antimicrobial stewardship, whether you have a program, whether you have a plan to implement a program, or you do not have a program in place. And in just a minute, we'll have those results of kind of where everyone's at on the call today. And, and those results will be up in just a minute. All right. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, the vast majority of people uh, answered D. So um, 52 respondents said that they have a feasible plan in place to implement the program, but don't quite have one in place yet. There were 26 people um, who said that they already have an antimicrobial stewardship program in place, and um, just nine people said that they don't have anything in place at this point. So um, we're going to focus a little bit today about, um, you know, how you as part of your antimicrobial stewardship program or just as an independent practitioner within a long-term care facility um, can help contribute to improving the use of antibiotics surrounding uh, urinary tract infections and other um, differentiations of colonization versus infection. So um, by the end of today's talk, I'd like you to be able to understand the differences between colonization and infection uh, as it relates to judicious antibiotic use, to be able to recognize some of the appropriate steps involved with assessing a patient who may have a urinary tract infection, be familiar with some of the measures of success related to the appropriate treatment of a suspected UTI, and lastly to more, and probably most importantly, to identify resources and tools that you can use in managing these patients with suspected infection. So we're going to start with a quick patient case. Um, there's an 82-year-old long-term care resident with a tracheostomy uh, who has a new fever and productive cough. Uh, she has an indwelling urinary catheter because of long term, because of incontinence, but she doesn't have any acute urinary or other symptoms. 
Uh, she does have a clad venous stasis ulcer on her lower extremity, but that is also unchanged. And because of these new fevers, um, a pan culture is initiated. So a urine gets set for UA and culture, a sputum is set for culture, and that's uh, tracheal aspirate, and uh, blood cultures are set, as well as a swab of the leg ulcer is set for culture. So based on what grows, uh, or uh, in terms of our results, the chest x-ray is done, and that's negative. Um, the sputum culture on um, gram stain has no uh, PMNs or no polymorphine neutrophils and no organisms, but it ends up growing one plus candida albicans. The urinalysis has three white blood cells and ends up growing a, greater than 100,000 CFUs of E. coli. And uh, upon susceptibility testing, it has been found to be resistant to all tested antibiotics, including carbapenem. Uh, the wound swab grows VRE. And then we have to figure out what to do about this patient. So the patient gets started on IV colistin, which is a highly toxic medication for the treatment of the E. coli in the urine because it's resistant to all um, contemporary antibiotics. Additionally, uh, the patient started on linazolid for VRE in the, the wound and fluconazole for transit and sputum. Then kind of uh, to some extent, a little bit expectedly, the patient develops acute kidney injury from the colistin, thrombocytopenia from the linazolid, and then after um, completing therapy, develops diarrhea for which the patient is has, uh, testing is positive. So this patient has a lot of complications when inevitably they really only had an a upper respiratory tract infection, which is most commonly viral and probably didn't need any of the therapies that were initiated uh, in, this, in this setting. So what are some of the lessons that we can learn from cases like this, which I'm sure are inevitably happening in all of your facilities? We really need to understand the difference between colonization and infection. Uh, I'm sorry to say that as many as you may think you are very clean people and may have many clean residents living in your facilities, everybody is coated and covered in bacteria and fungi all over their bodies. Um, and these bacteria and fungi, they don't cause infection necessarily. They just live there symbiotically, um, both, you know, inside our gut as well as on our skin and in other various parts of our body. Now, if a patient develops or if a person develops an infection, it's usually going to be from those bacteria and fungi that do colonize patients. And also note that those bacteria and fungi that are colonization can be transmitted from one person to another um, via personal contact, and that most commonly happens from patient to patient uh, via the hands of healthcare workers. So um, colonization, although it does not warrant treatment, often does require additional uh, consideration for precaution, and especially when it comes to things like hand hygiene. So as we saw in our patient, we saw some pretty bad bugs when we looked at the colonization, and that often prompts a visceral response to want to treat that, uh, that um, bug. But if anything, that's the patient in whom we probably shouldn't be treating colonization because what we've seen in patients like this is that the patient with the bad, bad bug is particularly vulnerable to developing resistance. And for that E. coli in the urine that was resistant to all antibiotics that we tested, uh, we had at least a, a plan D in place that we could implement with IV colistin, but then the next organism that grows in that patient could be colistin resistant, and we could have an, an instance in which there are no uh, available antibiotics to treat an infection. So these patients with recurrent infections, and notably uh, with recurrent and resistant infections, those patients should be approached with an even higher threshold to treat because uh, we know that this is not their first infection and it's not their last. And every time we introduce an antibiotic, we are in promoting resistance and potentially uh, making it harder to treat down the line. There's this concept called the iceberg effect that graphically represents uh, colonization versus infection. So when we think about the tip of the iceberg that we can see, that those are the patients with infections. They have clinically present pathogens that are causing disease, and we try to look for you know, look for them and see what they are and and treat them appropriately. However, when we dig deeper and try to look below the surface, there's a whole lot going on down there that uh, can be pretty overwhelming once you start looking for it. Additionally, the labor is associated with trying to 
look for what's below the surface with, an, with um, kind of looking at the bottom of an iceberg is really the equivalent of trying to drain the ocean. It's a very labor-intensive process that sometimes gives you information that you don't want to know about. Uh, but kind of with the same caveat of knowing that recognizing that colonization does exist and that we should uh, take certain precautions when we're trying to um, treat our patients to make sure that we're not transmitting some colonization from patient to patient and always using appropriate hand hygiene. So as we um, think about, you know, what's on the surface and, and treating our infections but not treating our colonization, we kind of run into this uh, potential paradigm of uh, trying to look too deep below the surface and therefore magnifying the iceberg and turning a mountain into a molehill. So it's important to remember that although, um, you know, we, we definitely want to aggressively treat infections when they're causing significant disease in our patients, uh, treating colonization really doesn't have a huge benefit to the patient. So when we think about, um, you know, not treating colonization, let's, we take it back to our patient and how we can tell that realistically this is primarily colonization and not infection. So when we look at the urine there, were, the UA was relatively bland with no white cells in the urine, so that probably wasn't a UTI. The patient probably didn't have an, a, a candida pneumonia, A, because candida very, very, very rarely causes a pneumonia and is most commonly just an oral contaminant, but also um, in the absence of dyspnea, hypoxia, and chest x-ray changing, changes, the likelihood that the patient had, even had a pneumonia is very unlikely. Um, we know that student cultures that are taken from uh, trach patients are very, very often positive with colonization. And lastly, when we swab that wound, um, you know, you, you're always going to find, you know, organisms in the wound. And the differentiation between infection and colonization really is a clinical determination rather than a microbiologic determination. So here's, I've got this, it's probably the four most common sites that in which colonization can be mistaken as infection. I'm going to spend the most time talking about urine because that's probably the one that gets misclassified the most. This is so much of a, uh, an issue that the Infectious Diseases Society of America have uh, released an entire set of guidelines solely uh, dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria. That means bacteria in the urine in the absence of any clinical symptoms. And what they have found after scouring the literature in various different patient populations, that there are really only two indications for treating asymptomatic bacteria, and that includes uh, in pregnant women because of both hormonal and physiologic changes that increase the risk for adverse outcomes associated with having bacteria asymptomatically colonizing the, the genital urinary tract, as well as um, patients who are immediately undergoing urologic intervention. So that could include a TERP or any other urologic procedure in which there is mucosal bleeding. Because if we know that there is colonization of bacteria in the um, urinary tract and then there will be some sort of communication between the urinary tract and the bloodstream, it's kind of logical that you would want to prevent bacteria from going from the urinary tract to, to the bloodstream and causing you know, systemic infections. So those patients only need in a microbial therapy immediately surrounding the, the procedure and not long-term treatment. Now, they also, uh, within the set of guidelines, were able to characterize the incidence of asymptomatic bacteria. In relatively young, uh, healthy people, the incidence is relatively low with, you know, healthy premenopausal women having 1 to 5 percent of them having asymptomatic bacteria. But as people get older, and um, more co comorbidities confound, uh, we see that that incidence goes up dramatically with um, uh, uh, about 3 to 9 percent of postmenopausal women having asymptomatic bacteria, 9 to 27 percent of diabetic women having asymptomatic bacteria. It goes up a lot with age um, and as well as uh, living in a long-term care facility, which is what's the biggest focus for you guys today. So 25 to 50 percent of women that live in a long-term care facility and 15 to 40 percent of men that live in a long-term care facility um, are likely to have asymptomatic bacteria. And that colonization exists uh, kind of seamlessly without causing significant infection, and therefore it's important for us to differentiate those people from the ones that actually do have infections. 
Now, there is a lot of um, physiologic reasons for older people um, to have this increased risk of asymptomatic bacteria. Very often there is um, obstructive problems like overflow incontinence or BPH um, that can uh, inhibit the passage of urine through the urinary tract. And then once you've got stagnant urine, it's kind of like mucky pond water. It just sits there and festers and develops bacteria. Similarly, with patients with spinal cord injuries, they may have you know, urge incontinence or neurogenic bladder that can um, impede urinary flow, and it just sits there and gets colonized. The, the last thing I'd really like to focus on here is indwelling catheter use. Um, so we know that even in the short term, 9 to 23% of patients will develop asymptomatic bacteria, but I cannot emphasize this enough. With long-term use, so at least what's been defined as about two to three weeks of having an indwelling catheter, all of those patients will get colonized with bacteria. So um, whenever we are assessing a patient with a uh, long-term indwelling catheter that's been in place for at least two weeks, we have to assume that no matter what, it will be colonized with bacteria. I spoke a little bit earlier about using the urinalysis to help differentiate um, colonization versus infection. However, it's important to remember that uh, asymptomatic pyuria, so the presence of white blood cells, uh, may also accompany asymptomatic bacteria in many of these circumstances. So asymptomatic pyuria occurs in 32% of young women, um, 30 to 70% of pregnant women, 70% of di diabetic women, 90% of these um, elderly institutionalized patients 90% of these hemodialysis patients are going to have asymptomatic priuria. 30 to 75% of these patients um, who have short-term catheters, and 50 to 100% of these already clearly colonized patients with long-term indwelling catheters are going to have asymptomatic priuria as well. Now, I've spoken a little bit about the um, that it's not necessary to treat these asymptomatic bacteria patients, but I just want to highlight that it has been actually studied of whether there really is any benefit to it. And um, in this study that actually looked at uh, patients with diabetes who had asymptomatic bacteria at the time of the start of the study, they looked at whether treating that asymptomatic bacteria impacted their ability to prevent symptomatic urinary tract infections going forward. And what they found is that over time, looking at almost, uh, you know, three years, there really was no difference in the incidence of symptomatic UTI, whether or not asymptomatic bacteria got treated. So it really has no beneficial outcomes in terms of preventing infection and then could have the negative effects that come along with antibiotics, including resistance, adverse drug reactions, and, um, and C. diff. So there's been a lot of chatter um, in our prior uh, webinars about the McGear criteria and how to tell if somebody does indeed have a UTI. Now, the McGear criteria is a, uh, a tool that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with um, that has been developed for surveillance of the outcome and uh, surveillance and outcome assessment. However, it's not great in the actual diagnostic or necessity of treatment. Um, the LONAP criteria, however, is um, a treatment algorithm that um, recommends a minimal set of criteria that's necessary to initiate antibiotic treatment for UTIs. And this is uh, really based on um, the IDSA guidelines and actual um, evidence-based uh, treatment data. So here I'm going to show you um, the LOBE uh, diagnostic tree. So it starts with um, if a patient has a fever, um, that kind of triggers the decision um, along which to even work up the patient for a UTI. So if a patient has two or more signs or symptoms that are of a non-urinary tract infection, so some other symptoms, that would not be, um, then you wouldn't order a urine culture, you would just work up that other infection. Um, but if the patient did not have other signs or symptoms, that would prompt for you to order a urine culture if they are exhibiting these symptoms. Um, if a patient is um, catheterized, uh, uh, that, that's if the patient is catheterized. If the patient is not catheterized, you would still want to look for some new signs or symptoms like vertebral angle tenderness, um, rigors, new onset delirium, um, 
which I want to highlight is not necessarily mild fluctuations in ultra mental status um, or um, order a, a urine culture if there are two or more of these uh, typical urinary tract infection symptoms. Now, I will also note, nowhere in here does it recommend initiating treatment at the time of uh, first suspicion. If the patient is clinically stable, it's recommended to take a culture for the patients in whom UTI is suspected and then wait for those results to come back. So as the patient is clinically stable, if they have a urine culture that has no growth, you can assume that the, the patient does not have a urinary tract infection and therefore no antibiotics are required for the treatment of the UTI here. If the, the urine culture is positive, then you can go down the decision tree to decide whether or not um, antibiotics are indicated. And at that point, you can target your antibiotics to the appropriate therapy. I'd like to highlight that um, the, the role of altered mental status as a diagnostic criteria is really diminished within this um, algorithm because it recognizes that there are several other symptoms of urinary tract infections that are a little bit uh, more specific to the diagnosis, diagnosis that should be, have pretty significant consideration when working up a patient for treatment of UTIs. So kind of to go further on that topic, um, long, many long-term care facilities uh, that already have cognitive impairment are more likely to have asymptomatic bacteria, so that positive culture without any symptoms. Additionally, patients with cognitive impairment are more vulnerable to any changes or fluctuations in their mental status when there is any new problem, and that could be a UTI or any other um, infection or other reason to have an acute change in mental status. So when you have a patient with pre-existing cognitive impairment and a change in mental status, they're more likely to have a positive urine culture, um, and that's independent of whether the infection is the cause of the clinical decline or, if an infection is present, whether the urinary tract, infect, uh, urinary tract actually is the source of that infection. There's been this tool developed that helps you work through a patient with an acute change in mental status and recognize that there are various factors that could contribute to an acute change in a patient's mental status. So it could be, uh, the, the acronym is delirium, but so the D could be any drugs, uh, specifically goes on the Beers criteria, um, or a patient could have, you know, fluctuations within their dementia, or they might even be discomfort, uncomfortable or experiencing pain that can in itself cause some change in mental status. Um, for E, we think about their eyes, ears, and environment, and making sure that they are understanding their environment, whether they have all the appropriate nece necessary aids like glasses or hearing aids um, to be able to understand what's going on around them. The L stands for low oxygen states, um, and that can be a significant clinical emergency. The I stands for infection, but note that not only is, could it be UTI, but as well pneumonia, sepsis, or really any other infection as well. The R stands for retention, so urinary retention or constipation. Um, the second I stands for ictal states, um, so if a patient has a seizure disorder. The U is for underhydration or nutrition. As we know, dehydration is a significant problem in our elderly population and a significant contributor to changes in, in mental status. There can be some metabolic causes like low or high blood sugar or potentially some electrolyte abnormalities. And lastly, subdural hematoma, especially if the patient has recently uh, experienced a trauma. Now, when we think about um, working up altered mental status, we also need to think about the potential other sources of infection um, as well as um, whether other sites can also be colonized. So as we saw in our case patient, the sputum, uh, the tracheal aspirate was colonized with, with uh, candida, but note that there are also other reasons that we could misdiagnose a patient with pneumonia. So viral infections uh, can often present similar to bacterial infections, but generally the hallmark differences are that the uh, that upper respiratory infections um, typically result, are self-limiting and resolve within a week, and also um, tend to... Uh, present more with rhinorrhea, so more nasal congestion than um, lower respiratory tract infections that have more uh, breathing abnormalities. Uh, patients may often have positive treatment cultures due to oropharyngeal colonization, so just 
you know, schmutz that's living in your mouth rather than actual um, bacteria from the lungs. Remember that a lot of our elderly patients often lack the respiratory drive to really cough up a good sample from deep in their lungs. And when you, you do collect the sputum culture, you're very often just collecting what's in their mouth, which is not necessarily indicative of what's going on down in their lungs. So in order to evaluate a sputum culture, we look at two things on the gram stain to help us assess for oral contamination. So number one, we look for squamous epithelial cells, cells which are skin cells, um, to determine, um, you know, whether you're picking up oral, uh, as we have a lot of cell turnover in our mouth that we should be picking up oral contamination. Also, we look for neutrophils or white blood cells um, that could be indicative that you are looking at some uh, sample that has an infective process going on. Lastly, um, when we see a positive chest x-ray without any clinical signs or symptoms, uh, there can be many non-infectious causes to develop an infiltrate. So also remember that if a patient had a prior pneumonia, it can take one to two months uh, to see uh, radiologic resolution in an elderly patient. So um, what we really look for is an acute change in chest x-ray findings to help diagnose a pneumonia. Um, remember that Antibiotics are not indicated for upper respiratory in, uh, tract infections, um, and that a positive sputum culture in the absence of acute chest x-ray findings are not an appropriate uh, indication for treatment. Additionally, chest x-ray findings with the absence of symptoms, um, as I mentioned, um, that improvement can take a couple weeks to even months. Um, and lastly, if you have chest x-ray findings that are consistent with a non-infectious or viral process, so that could mean uh, potentially if a patient has influenza, or if they have um, a cough or fever that gets better and then worse, that could be a bacterial superinfection after influenza. So it's important to think about the, the likelihood of, of viruses playing a role in a patient's pulmonary infection. Um, so one kind of caveat is that antibiotics should be considered for moderate to severe uh, COPD exacerbations. Specifically, if there is worsening dyspnea or increased sputum volume with increased sputum purulence. Um, however, this usually warrants hospitalization, so very often you won't have to worry about this within your long-term care facility. Um, another site that often gets misclassified as uh, for, between colonization versus infection it are wounds. So the British Society uh, of um, antimicrobial chemotherapy and the European Wound Management Association. So these are European guidelines, not American ones, but they still have a lot of great guidance on um, how to assess and treat wounds. Um, what's very noteworthy is that we only prescribe antibiotics for wounds that are clinically infected. So that means that wound infections need to be diagnosed both clinically and microbiologically. Um, so um, we obtain a culture before starting therapy only in clinically infected wounds, and that uh, includes uh, wounds that um, are, are perhaps uh, newly training or uh, showing signs of erythema, redness, inflammation, things like that. However, if a patient is clinically stable, um, you know, that is not an indication to initiate antibiotic treatment. Uh, additionally, these guidelines note that, you know, duration of therapy should only be one to two weeks for something that's limited to the soft tissue, and six weeks for bone infection because uh, the wound may take longer to heal than the infection, and therefore you don't need to continue antibiotics for the duration that the wound exists. There's a great um, flow diagram to help determine uh, whether or not a wound is clinically infected, and if it is, whether or not um, antibiotics should be initiated. And I have the reference here for you to access this, this um, flow diagram for later, but I would just highly recommend really considering the likelihood of infection when you're deciding whether or not to treat a wound. The last um, site I want to talk about differentiating colonization versus infection is for the diagnosis of C. diff. So there are several different tests that you can use um, for checking for C. diff, and they all have varying specificity and sensitivity. So the um, so many uh, Institutions start with the toxin assay, which is a highly specific but poorly sensitive test because um, you take a stool sample and, you know, you want to look to see if the patient has C. diff. Um, we look for the toxin itself, and that toxin is very labile at room temperature and can 
the grade over a matter of a couple of hours, potentially before the test is run. Um, so therefore, if you may not catch every test, every case if you do the toxin assay alone. Some places are using PCR. However, PCR may be overly sensitive and uh, may identify patients as C. diff positive when they are not clinically infected with C. diff at that time. It can pick up patients who have recently had C. diff but have experienced clinical cure because patients may continue to shed um, C. diff in their stool for a little bit after their uh, infection as well as um, patients who are colonized with C. diff uh, asymptomatically but not currently infected can also be PCR positive, but because they're not actively shedding toxin, they, um, they, are not, they don't have clinical C. diff, nor do they warrant uh, treatment. So these are all the different um, types of uh, specimens that in which colonization can get confused with, with, uh, with actual infection. And next, we'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, an initiative um, that was really focused on improving the use of antibiotics in patients with suspected UTIs. So I'm going to pass it over to Shira now. Great. Thank you. Um, so many of you, or some of you, may have been a part of this initiative uh, from a few years ago. Um, and you can see the, the various partners um, the Department of Public Health was involved and um, the, part, the, the partner organizations there at the, on the slide that were involved in this collaborative. Um, and those of you who, who were involved, this, the, the techniques here will sound familiar, but you may not have seen the results, so hopefully you'll be interested in those uh, anyway. The goals of our initiative were to improve the evaluation and treatment of urinary tract infection, to decrease treatment for asymptomatic bacteriuria, to use clinical quality improvement tools for decision support and to communicate with patients and their loved ones for safer care. So what we did was we carried out these two consecutive programs. And you can sort of think about the first one as a pilot for the second one, and we tweaked some of the, um, the strategies. But essentially, both involved kickoff workshops and a lot of calls and webinars to teach providers the difference between colonization and infection, particularly as it applies to the assessment of a, of a long-term care facility resident that may have uh, urinary tract infection. We actually um, included both hospital and long-term care facilities in the first um, um, program, which was from 2012 to 2013, um, and because of limited engagement by those acute care facilities, did not include them in the, in the second program, which was from 2000. 13 to 2014, and throughout that period, we did surveys, we measured, we monitored, uh, and we collected data, which I will show you. These programs involve roundtable discussions, a lot of give and take between facilities and program um, organizers and experts on what works and what doesn't work um, when attempting to improve the use of antibiotics for suspected urinary tract infection. infection. And what we came up with was a, a series of tools. Um, and I'm going to show you a link um, where you're going to be able to access all these tools for use in your own facility in a, in a couple of slides. Um, but the main tool was called the ABCs of UTI, and I'm, I'm blowing up each section here so you can see really what, um, what it includes. And so the A is for assessment, and this is where you are assessing a long-term care resident for clinical signs and symptoms of UTI. This is what you're going to use for any patients where anybody where the, the, the thought of UTI has entered your mind. Um, does this resident meet criteria for having signs and symptoms of UTI? Um, and you can see that it's divided into residents without indwelling catheters and residents with indwelling catheters. And so on the side of resident without indwelling catheter, you also see that acute dysuria alone is enough of a criterion to uh, proceed with an evaluation for UTI. So if it burns when the person pees, that's something you take seriously. But if it doesn't, then you need to prove it. And you need to prove it either by having fever and a specific symptom that's referable to the urinary tract. And if you don't have fever, then you need to have two of the symptoms that are referable to the urinary tract. So um, those symptoms are urgency, frequency, superfusive pain, gross hematuria that's blood in the urine, 
passivitibral angle pain or tenderness or urinary incontinence. And obviously that would be new urinary incontinence. And so you, what you see that's glaringly absent here is mental status changes. Those are not specific enough to the urinary tract to be considered a symptom of urinary tract infection. Other things that are absent are malodorous urine, cloudy urine. Those are not considered symptoms of the urinary tract infection. Now, if you have a resident with an inline catheter, it just becomes harder. Um, and you're going to end up treating um, more patients with urinary catheters um, because it's just so, so much harder to determine whether they have specific urinary symptoms. So those patients don't have acute dysteria. Um, and so in that case, the criterion is one of the symptoms um, that we discussed, um, whether it's fever, or CVA, pain, rigors. Delirium here is included, blank pain, pelvic discomfort, acute, acute hematuria, or malaise, or lethargy. And so what you can see here is it, it does become more, um, you know, less specific, easier to err on the side of treatment. And so the lesson then to be, to be learned from this is you really, really want to avoid putting in those indwelling catheters. Those people are going to have a high, high rate of positive urine culture, essentially 100% if the catheter has been in for two and, two and three weeks. And so those catheters should only be used in patients who cannot urinate without them, so that does not include patients who are bed-bound um, or who want it because they, um, you know, for comfort or, you know, or for ease of cleanup, um, it should really be for patients with um, neurogenic type bladder and obstructive bladder issues. Moving on to B, um, this is where we look at the urinalysis, uh, that B is for bacteria, um, the culture, and the sensitivity, if above criteria are met. Now, in reality, many, pa many patients are going to have those cultures sent even if the above criteria are met, and the hard thing to do is going to be to ignore that lab result if the if symptoms um, and criteria from A are not met, and we'll, just, we'll talk about that more in a minute. So you're going to, going to collect um, either a clean, avoided specimen if possible. Now, it's difficult to do a clean cast, and it's, it's especially difficult for an elderly and perhaps demented person to do a clean cast. Um, and so an in-and-out in -and -out catheter might be necessary and is definitely um, uh, a better study. Um, for residents with chronic indwelling fluid catheters, again, 100% are going to have a positive culture. So there is no point in doing the culture if you're not going to change that catheter. Um, even when you change it, you're really just decreasing the colonization on the catheter, not the bladder. Um, but it will help to, to, send, to change the catheter and send the urine um, from the new catheter, um, and that should definitely be done if you're considering sending a culture from a patient with a chronic catheter. Um, certainly other laboratory studies can be um, considered if the patient looks ill, i.e. if they have, you know, lethargy or fever, um, so CBC, um, lights and a presence, the presence of an elevated white cat helps you determine whether the patient has an infection, um, even in the absence of fever, and that infection, of course, may not be a urinary tract infection. Um, so you're going to look at whether the nitrites, the, whether the urinalysis has nitrites, leucosterase, high urea. You're going to note all those things. And then if there's a positive culture, the relevant numbers are greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth, if you, um, per ml of colony forming units, if it's a clean cat specimen, and you want there to be two or fewer organisms. If you see more than that, you um, are most certainly dealing with colonization. Um, and if it's a categorized specimen, specimen, you can decrease your threshold to consider an infection to 10 to the third, again, only if you have um, symptoms. Or you may have a negative urine culture, and then you're done with that assessment. Um, and that brings us to C, the care plan. Um, and Note that that starts with criteria being met for UTI symptoms and a positive urine culture. Um, and, and, you know, and, and the bubble below it, criteria not met for UTI symptoms in there, like I said, it does not matter if you have a, a positive urine culture. So if you meet the criteria um, for symptoms and positive culture, that's when you want to think about treating with antibiotics, continuing to monitor vital signs, monitor fluid intake, and, and increase fluid intake if indicated. But if you don't meet those criteria, that patient or that resident actually needs more 
follow-up actually needs uh, more attention um, and um, closer monitoring. So you want to then ask yourself, well, what is the diagnosis? The patient had um, various symptoms that I was concerned about, be it altered mental status, for example. Um, so what, what is the situation now that I have uh, assessed the patient, um, either done a urine filter or not? Um, is there an alternate diagnosis that may be possible? Has, has their mental status returned to baseline? And this was really just part of the normal fluctuation in, in the mental status of a patient with underlying dementia from day to day. We want to continue to monitor their vital signs and symptoms probably even more closely than the one that's been diagnosed with a UTI, monitor their fluid intake and increase it if needed, and reevaluate in case the above criteria for symptomatic UTI emerge. At any point, if you've decided that a, a, one of these residents does or does not have an infection, you want to con you can reevaluate and review with the MD or NP or PA. Um, and the, the vital signs to be concerned about would be a fever um, greater than 100.5, an elevated or low heart rate, elevated respiratory rate, low or high blood pressure, changing oxygen uh, saturation, or changes in um, their normal blood glucose. Now, it is important prior to treatment, even if a patient meets all the criteria for UTI symptoms and has a positive urine filter, to note whether um, the goals of care are consistent with treatment with antibiotics. So some patients have an directive to limit treatment, including antibiotics, and you don't want to be doing that if um, family members have decided that that is not consistent with the goals of care for that resident. Um, that will contribute to resistance in that resident, which can then be spread to other residents. You do want to review medication allergies before starting treatment, obviously, and check whether that resident is on warfarin, Coumadin, because many of the antibiotics do have interactions. Um, the, uh, we went over the co possible causes for mental status, and this tool has reminders about those here. We also created clinician education sheets, and um, these have a lot of information on them that we recommended be posted in uh, work areas so that all uh, providers could uh, read the information. Um, so definitions of asymptomatic bacteriuria, um, some myths, again, with a cloudy or malodorous urine myth, um, things like whether a follow-up urine culture is needed to confirm successful treatment of UTI, and the answer is no. Um, some graphs showing how uh, antibiotic use uh, breeds resistance and the association between resistance and the risk of death. Um, we introduced this concept of a stoplight when it comes to evaluating patients for UTI, and um, red is the idea that if a patient has no symptoms of UTI, stop there and do not test the urine. Um, yellow is that in-between patient that might have something like weakness, um, delirium, or fever with no specific uh, foci, no, no symptoms that are specifically referable to the urinary tract. I think those are the patients you really have to use caution and think about. Um, and then green, patients with specific UTI symptoms. It burns when they pee, um, and those are patients that should be treated um, and should be tested. Um, and and some, a list of some challenges, and I think, you know, the biggest challenge that um, everyone spoke about during the course of those collaborative um, programs was the resident's family wanting a urine test and antibiotics. Um, even in the setting of asymptomatic bacteria, and we did a lot of role playing and a lot of discussion about how to educate the family about the prevalence of asymptomatic bacteria, um, and how to explain to him to them um, that you don't suspect UTI, but that you are still going to monitor the patient closely, and that that does not mean that you're ignoring um, whatever it is that um, has changed. Because that's been the biggest challenge, we created a resident and family brochure, um, which explains the concept of antibiotic resistance um, and the concept of colonization versus infection and the concept of asymptomatic bacteriuria. And the bottom line is that we encourage everybody to be critical thinkers, the providers, the family members. Um, and so the link here, um, which you can note or write down, um, is www macoalition.org slash UTI hyphen elderly hyphen tools, um, but you can also just 
um, do a search on the internet for the Massachusetts Coalition for the Prevention of Medical Errors and you will find it. Um, so here are some results that we gathered from that initiative. Um, as I said, we had a, a year one program and a year two program, and in each we had over 30 facilities to participate. Um, year one, we had 17 of those submit data, and in year 225. Um, and we actually had 13 facilities stay with us for the duration of the entire two-year period. And in each year, we looked at well over 300,000 uh, resident days and compared them with a baseline period. So this is um, urine culturing rate. So what, uh, how many urine cultures were sent for 10,000 resident days? And so this is the first collaborative, the first year. And you can see these are 17 facilities that submitted data. And you can see uh, that uh, vertical line, uh, the vertical line here is uh, where the intervention began. And um, it's visually apparent that there were fewer urine cultures being done after the intervention. Um, but this is actually uh, what it looked like for those 12 facil facilities that continued to participate in the collaborative for the entire two years. Um, and I find it interesting that, uh, you know, collaborative two, as I said, we did tweak some of the messaging, but it wasn't that different from collaborative one. It just really highlights the fact that when you're doing initiatives like this, you need to keep on um, – you know, keep, keep your foot on the gas and continue to um, drive the message home within your facility. Um, and so um, this is the baseline period. This is that period where these 12 facilities were doing collaborative one. This is the intercollaborative uh, period. And then in collaborative two, they continue to see improvement in urine culturing. And these are the new facilities that only participated in collaborative two. And you can see they had some, some good uh, results as well. Now, these numbers here are the rate of UTI diagnosis. So how many residents were diagnosed by a provider as having UTI for 10,000 resident days? And again, you can see that the um, facilities that participated in the first collaborative had a, a lower rate of calling something a UTI uh, after the intervention began. And again, these are those who participated in both collaboratives, um, and they continue to see improvement, and these are those who only participated in the second. Um, and then lastly, we did look at rates of CDF because that is uh, monitored by all facilities. And what we saw um, was particularly here in the first collaborative, um, we had uh, incident rate ratios that were lower than one in all uh, of the different groups that we compared. But it was actually quite statistically significant if you look at the confidence interval um, during the first collaborative. So we, we do believe that we may have seen some decrease in CDF rates. We were not able to, me to measure antibiotic usage rate, but we kind of think of this as a proxy for that. Again, here's the link. Um, this is the um, website, Massachusetts Coalition for the Prevention of Medical Errors, so you can Google that. You would find all of this under initiatives. These are initiatives related to elimination of healthcare-associated infections, and this is um, the evaluation and treatment of UTI in the elderly initiative. All of those um, tools that I just showed you, plus um, all of the uh, PowerPoint presentation slides that we used in the various webinars are available on the site for public use. Just to point out, if you're using the Interact uh, tools, which many of you may be, they align very well with the tools that are on that website and that we use in the collaborative. Um, so the care path symptoms of urinary tract infection um, uh, there's absolutely no um, discrepancies between what's recommended by these and what we recommend um, in those um, those tools that I just showed you. Um, you know, basically that um, you want to only do um, your analysis for for patients who have symptoms and signs of UTI, which are here, and you'll see there is nothing about altered mental status here. Um, but also the care paths for acute mental status change and um, uh, changes in behavior align with it as well in that um, they do not recommend um, urine uh, culturing um, for patients with altered mental status um, or changes in behavior. Um, the, the initiatives that I mentioned were funded by the CDC. There was a great team of individuals that were involved. Uh, in them, so I just wanted to put that information there. 
And um, so I wanted to make sure we ended um, early enough to take uh, questions, um, but we're going to do uh, one more polling question before we finish. So just uh, Jennifer, if you can open up the polling questions. Um, I feel that the strategies discussed in today's webinar are largely, and so we'd like you to uh, give us feedback by stating whether you think that the strategies that we just described are feasible in your facility A, not feasible in your facility B, or already being used in your facility, and I hope that some of you will answer C, particularly if you were involved in the initiatives that I already described. So. Um, please uh, go to the right side of your screen and enter the poll, um, A, feasible, B, not feasible, C, already being used, and we will um, take a look at those results and um, hopefully use them to uh, help you uh, reach your goals over the course of the next several webinars that we have going on. I'll take this time to mention that the next webinar is on June 1st, and it focuses on antibiotic selection, de-escalation, and duration. And you'll note that we did not talk about antibiotic choices for urinary tract infection um, today uh, because we really wanted to focus on the evaluation of the patient. Um, okay, so happy to see that um, no one felt that the strategies that we recommended were not feasible. Um, so that's um, terrific. And we do have a few people that are uh, already using um, these strategies. Uh, but we have a lot of people who felt that they're feasible. So I'm really, really um, happy um, to share that. I'm going to pass the ball back to a lazy and um, and um, she'll take us out and take us to question and answer. Great. Thank you, Shara. Um, so now, thank you, everyone, for uh, for participating. We are going to open up the lines for questions. You can press pound six to ask a question, or you can uh, you can pose your question over um, on the chat box. So to, to unmute your line, please press pound six. To ask any questions. Okay, let's see. Uh, quiet group. Let me just check the chat box. No question at, questions at this time. Uh, oh. We have a question. Oh, hi. Go right ahead. Hi. Our question is, how do you recommend getting a specimen from someone with an SP2? Is it super PV2, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's um, obviously a problem because you're not going to change it um, necessarily for the indication of getting um, a culture because that's an invasive procedure. Um, I would just keep in mind that that culture is always going to be positive 100% of the time and ask yourself what the utility of that culture is. So if you are 100% sure that that patient has a urinary tract infection, um, then you're, you're getting that culture to, to identify the organism. You're not getting it to answer the question about, about um, infections because that culture is not going to answer the question about whether your patient has infection or not. Right. Okay. There is a question in the chat box about physicians on board um, with ignoring asymptomatic colonization, and that's really where that clinician education sheet comes in. It uh, touches on a lot of points that they would be a little bit more sensitive to about um, acknowledging the harm that could come to patients from inappropriately using antibiotics. And additionally, um, not the next webinar, but the one after, is going to talk about some of the metrics that you as uh, long-term care facilities are responsible for and reminding them that, you know, every, uh, you know, every course of antibiotics that can lead to C. diff could be a negative mark on your uh, scorecard. So we really want to make sure that we're um, not only providing the best care to our patients, but also making your institution look as good as it can on paper. Um, 
if you're finding that you have physicians at your facility that um, are not aware of this issue or not on board with the concept, you may want to use more of the tools within within that, that website that I just showed you, um, including the PowerPoint slides. Um, but what you may really need to do is bring in experts to speak to your physicians face-to-face. -to -face. Um, and so one of the things that we're really recommending throughout these sessions is that you think about how to partner um, with an acute care facility, with a stewardship team that's already in place and successful at another facility, uh, with an academic medical center, and, and, and those partnerships have been um, have proven to be very successful in, um, you know, getting the right people, talking to the right people. One of the biggest issues that we've heard about is psychiatry. Um, so many of the patients, you know, many of the residents in your facilities are seen by psychiatry for um, various issues, including behavior problems. Um, and we're hearing that many of the psychiatrists will say, um, I'm not starting this resident on any medication until there's a urine culture done and there's, um, a, you know, proof that the patient doesn't have a UTI. Um, and that obviously, you know, totally goes against everything that we've been talking about. Um, and so it's actually, it may be the psychiatrist you need to get on board um, before anybody else. Um, and so, again, these are, these are other techniques to do that. And then other things in the chat box that, um, yes, it, it, I, we agree that um, Nagira's criteria is a great surveillance tool, but this ABC uh, and the Lowe's criteria that we talked about are more for clinical decision-making and deciding whether or not antibiotics are indeed warranted. Great. Thank you, everyone, for all your questions. Um, if your questions have not been addressed, we'll make sure that we'll get someone to get back to you to address your questions. Um, so I have just a few last announcements before we end today's webinar. Um, we would like to highlight that the New England Green KYO has a new, new antibiotic stewardship collaborative focused on outpatient settings, which is great resource for medical directors or other prescribers that treat patients on the outpatient side. The collaborative continues through July of 2019, but we encourage anyone interested to spread the word and get involved as soon as possible before our enrollment closes. Um, you can reach out. Let me just slides. Um, please reach out to our team if you are interested in learning more about the Outpatient Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative. And as a reminder, um, we are now on social media. Uh, you can visit us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And New England QIO, QIO welcomes your feedback. Please come to complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar, and the link of the evaluation will also be, um, be shared via email. Today's presentation is also um, available on our website within the next few business days. A recording will, and, and the transcript will be posted. And again, thank you so much for attending. And we'll get back to any other question that was not addressed on the line. Can I, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Yes, you can. Um, so right ahead. Right. Uh, with this option, we were not able to sign into the WebEx. So all we had was the audio presentation today. Okay, I can put out that problem. Hello? Uh, hi. I, uh, so I can actually send you the presentation slides. I'm sorry you weren't able to log in. Um, did you get the login information? Yeah, we did. We did. I, I, after the presentation, I was trying to re-log in, but uh, for some reason it wouldn't accept it. And, of course, this was the one that we were the most interested in um, being a part of. But, Oh, if we can have a PowerPoint, that so would be sorry about that. Absolutely. I'm I will. Oh, no, I'm so sorry for that, that you weren't able to log into our WebEx. Um, what is your name? Uh, Mary Jo Galliani. I'm from Bay Point. Okay, uh, great. I will. If I could just jump in really quickly, see, this is Olivia. I'm the communications person here. A lot of times if there is an issue with WebEx, it's due to the firewall on your um, your uh, organization's computer. So you might want to check with your IT people to make sure that it's working correctly. Um, there are some firewalls that are in place that don't allow WebEx to go through. Uh, this isn't the first time that we've logged into WebEx, but this is the only one that was not able, that would not run. If you will. Right. And I, and I will definitely. 
I will definitely check with yeah. the IT people. Okay, great. Awesome. So, thank, thank you. Do we have any more questions before we close today's webinar? Uh, yeah, so there's a last question about handling a urine that uh, comes back with ESDL or VRE, but the patient is asymptomatic. That is the perfect example of the patient that should not be treated because if you treat that ESDL, you know it doesn't need it. The next time, it might not. It might be worse than an ESDL. It could be a part of the family that's not working at them. So those are the exact example of who we should not be treating and just ignore it, even though your gut tells you that it's bad and you want to do something about it. Great. Well, if we have, if we don't have any more questions on the phone or on the chat box, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for joining. The letter has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.